Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to talk about many, many things that are happening in the city of Missoula. It is First Friday, February 2nd, and I know that because First Friday is such a wonderful, wonderful um, event that happens in the downtown Missoula area, which uh, emphasizes the art culture that is Missoula. Um, I'll be talking to you guys about where we, where you guys can go between 5 and 8 p.m. during the uh, quintessential uh, uh, best part of the art walk. And also maybe we'll be able to see that full moon that's happening this week as well. Um, so I got uh, a Flagstaff Friday video for you guys. I got uh, City Council where uh, MCAT also um, was part of the meeting as well. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about uh, how the city of Missoula is moving forward with uh, solving the homeless problem here in Missoula. Um, what, what else do I have? I have events. I have other things. But one thing I do not have is... Um, the long-winded news segment I usually have. <laughs> so without further ado, let's talk about some of the things that are happening in terms of weather out there. So it is currently 30 degrees outside. You can expect your highs to be 40, so it's already nice out. I didn't have to wear like a beanie or anything. I uh, sported my uh, ponytail and my sweater. I was just like, yeah, I'm cool. So there's that winter advisory warning. Didn't feel like winter advisory warning. Uh, a little bit of snow on my car this morning, but nothing to be too worried about. Uh, tonight, that uh, rain, chances of rain is going to be mixturing to 30%. Saturday, is rain is likely on Saturday. Saturday night, you have that uh, rain-snow mixture with a low of 28 degrees. But pretty much, you're going to be uh, staying among, among high um, 40, I mean, highs in the 40s. Um, and then it will basically kind of stay that way throughout the weekend as well. Um, if you guys are interested in going to the snow places... Uh, <laughs> doing some outdoor recreational skiing or snowboarding, snowshoeing, uh, shushing. Um, you can go to Whitefish Mountains Resort. They got f 12 inches of fresh new powder, uh, 47 base, um, all sorts of wonderful snow happening there. Lost Trail had five inches last 24 hours, Showdown four inches, Blacktail five. Real Lodge hasn't had anything, but they're Eastern Montana, so they'll probably have something later on this week. Great Divide, um, one inch. Um, Snowball had three inches of fresh new snow, so um, if you guys are playing on going there. Discover Ski Area had a fresh powder of snow, and you can expect some more snow happening because you have that 100% chance of rain as well. Maverick Mountain, two inches. Bridgeable didn't have anything. Trenton past Ski Area, there's just no hope for that place, so don't bother. So <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful day, but um, without further ado, let's talk about some of the crazy movies that are coming out this week. This is time for, it's, it's time for Pre-Critic. All right, so starting off with Helen Mirren is back for from her stint of Lucky Number Fast and Furious 7 uh, to reenact the life of Sarah Winchester. Or was it Fast and Furious 8? Who cares? No, I don't keep track. Winchester has other actors in this movie, and it follows this old lady going crazy as as the guilt over the death of people from Winchester guns. Her family built these popular killing machines in the Old West, and this movie follows her guilt as she inherits their wealth and all the and that all that goes with owning a company which makes money off of killing people. But of course, the Winchester is now mostly associated with um, romanticizing the guns that won the West and fought during the Civil War. Not the guns of the people, but let's not get into that because this movie probably will. Ah, uh, foreign films, because there's no other movies coming out this weekend. Basically, imagine a movie from a perspective of an adult woman who loses who loses her lover. His family's daughter, who just happens to be the same age as her, um, bans her from attending her boyfriend's wake. This movie, it's a foreign, artsy film that follows this lady throughout her journey to reinvent herself and uh, perseverance through a difficult time that follows the death of a loved one. You know, don't worry. Um, you won't have to see this movie since it probably won't be playing in any theaters around town. Um, the Cage Provider. Um, as we get closer and closer to February and the Oscars, new movies are scarce and The Cage Fighter is not a movie. It's a documentary uh, that follows the aging man who goes back to fighting for money. Um, his family is not so on board with this and he risks everything to follow his dreams. This sounds basically like Rocky, but it's, not, it's, a, it's a documentary and I watched the trailer and just like this totally feels like just a random um, movie. So, you know, not sure how to feel about this movie. Hmm. All right, the end. That's about that. I have a flagship Friday for you video for you guys this week, and it's basically making fun of uh, 
uh, weebs. So without further ado, here is uh, <laughs> uh, Flagship Friday from CS Porter. And when I come back, I'll talk about everything you guys need to know what's happening in the city of Missoula pertaining to homelessness. What is this? What is it? I am. Oh my god! No! I. <laughs> I don't know what to talk to you. A fan of anime. So you are a What do you want? Ethan! Ethan! Ethan, come here! Come here, Ethan! Ethan, hurry up! Attack! This is slavery! Just attack! <laughs> Maximum speed! Uh, what am I? What happened to me? Please lock in! I use hidden eye technique! Maximum speed! No! We must charge up for this battle! <laughs> Maximum speed! Cheat! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Ethan, special move! <clears throat> Good job! Now I have reached my final score! Super Saiyan, One Piece, Nine Tails, Naruto, One Punch Mode. 52 minutes until it's dead. We must. We must get him. Ethan, get up. Wait, we gotta get him. We gotta get him. We gotta get him. We gotta get him. Yeah? You killed my father! <laughs> ah!
All right, now how can I top that for the rest of the show? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some city council. So the city of Missoula has a 15-year cable television franchise agreement with Charter Communication in which they inherited from Bresen Cable, which was bought out by Optimum. Basically, a lot of things happened within, like, the 15 years of this negotiation. So this is the first time Charter will actually be part of this negotiation for a new a renewal. So to prepare for an upcoming franchise cable renewal negotiation with Charter, Missoula com uh, Community Access Television, um, known as Missoula's Community Media Resources, which is to contract with the Busky Group from Sacramento, California, to conduct a community needs assessment regarding cable television needs in Missoula. The community needs assessment is an essential component of the preparation that is necessary to facilitate successful cable franchise renewal. So basically, um, this this whole point is where the Busky Group is going to be trying to get people together to determine what they want. MCAT to be in the future for the public because it's a public access and we want to know what kind of public utility MCAT will be for the public. So basically, Steve Johnson and Joel Baird talk about this and this is, um, this is that. Had to follow the city's directive to engage the Busky Group to conduct a community needs assessment. We feel like we can't do due diligence to what is likely to be a 10 year out contract without taking gauge of what the public needs and wants from MCAT in the coming decade. And Sue Busky's group has 30 years of experience in doing just that. What she plans to do is, uh, is meet with the, the city uh, senior management team on the contract negotiations with the cable company um, to hold leadership meetings and then focus groups and then online surveys. And the questions will be like, where do you see telecommunications going in the city of Missoula in the next 10 years? What interest do you guys have? You guys know that MCAT is moving into a brand new building in the year 2020 with three other partners, including the Missoula City County Public Library. It's going to be a very high profile move for us after living with what will be 30 years in the old Missoulian building around the corner. So uh, for us, it's a very exciting intersection in time, and we're very eager to see what the public has to say about the new MCAT and the 21st century in the new library building with the Children's Museum, Families First, UM Spectrum Science Discovery Center, and the library itself. So we have a lot of fat to chew, and this group is very good at, um, at uh, getting people together and getting them to... Uh, articulate what their needs and visions are. All right, so, so that was our uh, very own Joel Baird, general manager of MCAT, talking a little bit of background on that. Brian, um, so, and through the last 15 years in particular, Charter was once Optimum Cable, which was replaced by Bresnan. Um, Charter is a Western U.S. cable company that MCAT has never had to renew a contract with in the first place, and it was grandfathered in from the previous um, owners a couple years ago. When MCAT, of course, uh, you might have remembered MCAT being originally on Channel 7 and 11 before Charter ended up moving us to Channel 189 and 190. Here's Brian Von Losberg, and he's talking about how much this is going to cost. Um, Obviously, Charter has taken that role now via acquisition, and uh, particularly for new council members, what's the size, you know, what, what does the cable franchise free fee <laughs> result in from a dollar standpoint? Try to put some perspective around this. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that, you know, uh, people say the cable industry is in fluctuation, so the projections, I guess, would be optimistic. Right now, the city of Missoula takes in about $700,000 a year for the rental of the public right-of-way. So the cable company is paying the citizenry, as represented by local government, um, the price of renting the boulevards, the alleyways, the street maintenance, and so on, to turn a profit. That might be about $14 million on the TV aspect of their operations alone. That excludes the internet, that excludes the telephone provisions. So uh, of that amount, the city of Missoula collects about 700000 and through a contract with MCAT, allots to us about $490,000 a year. So along those lines, in constant dollars, which is sort of a nonsensical projection somewhere in the realm of reality, the contract is worth about $7 million. All right, so uh, part of the new contract, because he's associating with the 10 years with how much money we currently make for 
you know how much this contract will be worth in the long run so uh, one of the things that um, um, is going on here is this is that's um, the gross profit for charter on a quarterly basis is, is ten million three hundred and forty eight thousand dollars and that was in 2006 in 2015 before the uh, before acquisition of um, a couple of the uh, cable companies in town their uh, their quarterly uh, um, gross profit was three million three hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars so they're getting um, they got seven million dollars more between 2015 and 2016, and that was from Nasdaq. Uh, Brian Vallosberg talks about uh, w basically w what's um, going on with MCAT and what what should be improved. In a few conversations uh, about this, um, I've been really impressed with um, what I've heard from um, Sue Besky and, and Brian Grogan, and their um, experience with this is. Uh, quite evident in, in the discussions. Um, it's an important negotiation. MPI, MCAT plays a vital role uh, in the community. When we talk about community needs, um, you know, a very obvious sort of thing that's come up in some of the, the prior discussions has been the move to high definition uh, equipment. Um, uh, and you can imagine, you know, MCAT not being able to record and broadcast in that format. It, it, makes the channel incredibly stale and unappealing for lack of a better sort of description. So there's some things like that that are fairly obvious and then there are several more that are less obvious. Um, so happy to support this. Um, I'll leave it at that. All right, so that um, basically wraps up the meeting. Um, a couple other things is that uh, the city of uh, Missoula um, I mean, MCAD will be paying $32,000 uh, of its own budget to hire the uh, Buskey Group, which will get, which has been put on the con consent agenda where the city of Missoula will choose to approve it on Monday. Um, up next, we got Committee of the Whole. Vanessa, Cro Vanessa Crossgrove Fry, um, the Assistant Director of Idaho Policy Institute and Assistant Research Professor, School of Public Services for Boise State University, will be speaking to council about some of the latest concepts surrounding the fiscal implications and we have that meeting here for you guys today and I'm going to kind of go over it through you guys uh, over it um, many of the things that w w we're talking about it is how uh, Boise Idaho um, launched a program um, basically calling um, God, what was it called it was called uh, yeah I'm trying to pinpoint the right name for it um, Hmm. I thought I wrote it down somewhere, but I guess I didn't. But the whole idea is that housing for homeless. I mean, that's what the programs initiated is that they're going to um, indiscriminately be able to get homes for homeless while uh, addressing other issues in terms of like mental health, um, substance abuse issues as well. But here's Julie Armstrong, which kind of intro introduced um, this whole topic um, for the Committee of the Whole. I think we're losing the battle on a couple fronts, and I think it's important that we refocus on those fronts, and this is the business practice and the math behind that concept. Um, and she's very eloquent and very smart, and I encourage everybody to ask questions throughout the presentation instead of waiting. And at some point, um, if this goes on for very long, we will all recess and take a little break here and there, and, and Brian has agreed to make sure that we're not all falling asleep but uh, please ask her questions the the data she's going to give us today is primarily data from Boise only because we're not able to get the exact numbers and data yet here but Aaron's department is working on that um, very diligently the data is extremely similar I'd say within five to ten percent of the cost so the numbers she's going to give you today are representative of the cost savings and they are significant and I think there's going to be some raised eyebrows in this room um, when when you hear the numbers so I will let Vanessa take it from here all right so uh, Vanessa um, um, came and visited um, the city of Missoula on Wednesday maybe or a little bit early I don't know her schedule um, she and she talked about um, how Boise, Idaho dealt with the homelessness in 2015 and what some of the ongoing things. So this is some of the background stuff that she was talking about. Time and since then, I've been really interested in how, um, how we can better use our very few resources we have um, in the public sector, right? What are we doing with our resources? How are we allocating them? And how can we do better than we've been doing? And so um, 
<coughs> that's why the city ended up coming to me and saying, hey, can you help us understand this? We've been looking at it from the social sector side, but what if we looked at it in more with a more of a financial lens? So, um, so I'm going to go through um, some stuff with the city of Missoula that you know about, and then um, present some numbers that are based on the experiences in Boise, but based on the numbers of a, a project to address um, issues related to chronic homelessness here in Missoula with 25 people. But you'll see that. So we'll just move along here. All right. So that was Vanessa Fry, and she's uh, just starting getting the pre presentation going. Um, as of 2017, 344 homeless folk were identified with 42 or more that are considered chronic homelessness, which consists over a year, uh, which usually if, if somebody has been homeless for over a year, that's when they're considered chronic homeless, but also with mental and substance abuse factors thrown in there as well. Vanessa Fry thinks this isn't a one solution fixer in terms of just looking at the numbers. And this is her once again. If we think of our whole community and we say, you know, we want to use our resources to make our whole community better, that's kind of obscure, right? But then we can start thinking about, well, we want to really target our resources to people that are in some sort of housing crisis, housing instability. And we can target it on it more and say, well, you know, we really want to look at people that are experiencing homelessness. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking that target in a little bit more and saying, well, I'm going to focus in on those people that are experiencing chronic homelessness. And we know that those are some of the most vulnerable people in our community. And, and as I just said, they're using um, the, you know, the vast majority of the resources we have available. And um, this presentation talks a lot about numbers, and, um, but I want us all to recognize these are people, right? So we talk in the aggregate, we talk in the average. We need to recognize that even though we're targeting in, we can target in further to the individual. And if only we have the resources to, to help Vanessa Fry every day on a daily basis for my needs, right? So that's the idea of trying to target in, but I want to kind of give you a snapshot of what it, someone's experience actually is. All right, so uh, Vanessa Fry goes into the details about this a little bit more um, throughout this meeting. Every person in a homeless situation are different, and throughout this presentation, she talked about the financial implications uh, for communities that call 911 to being transported to the emergency room for resources for people who could have avoided these in the first place. So a lot of this is preventative care. W what is happening within the medical f uh, field to prevent and to lessen visits to hospitals has improved overall health and also been able to help the people who need to go to the hospital rather than something that could have been prevented, prevented um, just by doing preemptive stuff a little while. It's kind of like when you go to physical therapy and just like, oh, I got back problems and because my back, uh, because I don't stretch my back or I don't um, do simple, uh, I don't go for walks and stuff like that, I now my back is to a weak point where I fell down the stairs, that kind of thing, where uh, the kind of thought profit, thought profit, this thought process was actually used in what being done for providing assistance to, the, to those in need that would drastically reduce the $50,000 emergency room visit that these folks clearly don't pay, um, which is usually a cost that inherits into the community as well. So Brian Von Losberg talks about the costs associated with these folks within the criminal justice system. I mean, I want to think of it as, I'm thinking of it as an opportunity cost, but that may not be an accurate way to look at it. it there's a cost to the overall system where the system is overburdened with, with people. We're seeing this here every year. I've gone through budget cycle. There's been a talk about sort of the backlog that the, how do you capture those sort of, do you try to capture those sorts of costs or it would be difficult to assign values to them? I'm not sure how you would. Does so, the question make any sense? Right. No, I think so. So I think it's the, um, and I'll get into this a little bit. It's all my numbers are based on true costs. We know it's more than this, okay. right? Yeah. And so I'll, I'll get fair, to that fair, in, fair a, in a future slide. Yep. But I did want to just like tag something that Councilmember Michelle said, and that is this idea of the, the criminal justice system. I don't know if you have problem solving courts in Montana or in. Okay, so the. We should talk about that opportunity later. And so it's a, it's a, it's a way that um, Idaho, some communities, not all of the counties, have thought about taking targeted populations and really dealing with the, the issue at hand, which maybe isn't the criminal justice issue, it's the substance misuse issue or it's, some, it's a mental health issue. So, um, but it's a way to kind of um, reduce some of those issues that you were talking about. 
Yep. Um, some of the trends that have been happening in the city of Missoula on its own is that um, in terms of, of people who are usually being arrested uh, for uh, um, I guess uh, disturbing the peace that seems to be like a very just like broad thing and in terms of like going to the justice system a lot of times it's like you give a ticket to somebody who can't pay a ticket so they accumulate these tickets over time until they go to jail but they're not uh, a threat to other people that's the thing they're they're just there and a lot of times is that if you just put them in the jail with other people it doesn't really solve the problem it just kind of puts them there and then they're out again, and then they just, it's its like, it's a cycle that never seems to really stop. And it's one of the things that um, the city of Missoula is also looking into to figure out. Um, Julie Armstrong reacts to some of the numbers in savings just by implementing, um, just by basically putting a, a, a simple roof over some of these folk, people's heads. Um, let me just find that. Okay, here she is. Okay, so the video did not play, darn. Okay, so let's just skip that. Um, many of the capital for these programs are looking into private sectors um, that invest more in teachers and classrooms and helping people succeed when going back into society, reacclimating. Um, they get they get to the discussion portion of the meeting, which the informational part was over half the meeting, and I suggest you guys check it out later on during Committee of the Whole. You can access it online, mcat.org or anything like that. And of course, a lot of what I talked about, it's just a lot of more of the feelings and how people feel about uh, certain things. But let's dive deeper in what works in other communities and how Missoula can uh, follow in suit about other examples in reduction of chronic homelessness. Paul Varela Center's Executive Director, Amy Allison Thompson, talks about uh, so, uh, her reaction to this as well. So here's her. As Vanessa mentioned, Boise is likely about two years ahead of us, and so they engaged in this feasibility study and collection of data and really looking at what would work for their community, which is the process that we're just starting through the FUSE grant. And so we do know, though, that we have a core group of chronically homeless individuals in Missoula, it was 42 at the last count, who are high utilizers of our system, frequent utilizers of our hospital, criminal justice, behavioral health systems um, that we are not effectively serving now. So again, it's that, that double win of cost savings to the community and better outcomes for people who have been experiencing homelessness for decades. So this dovetails really well with both our division's current efforts, but also the stage that we're at within the 10-year plan to end homelessness, focusing on permanent supportive housing for our most chronically homeless individuals, um, especially even targeting further those struggling significantly with substance abuse and substance misuse issues is a key initiative in the plan and one that we had hoped we would be further along with at this point in time. And so I think that we're in a really good position to move ahead with that um, through the FUSE process with solid data that we can collect and work with the county and our hospital systems and the, the um, criminal justice system and work in alignment with other plans like the jail diversion master plan to really make some headway on these. All right. So um, there's, I mean, a lot of things are being done in the city of Missoula. That's, that's definitely a thing that's happening here. And one of the biggest issues is that um, is the reason why we invited uh, Vanessa Fry into our community to talk about this is trying to figure out a way where um, instead of um, doing um, I guess in a lot of ways doing reactive, reactive um, I guess uh, reactive care, we're trying to do figure things to help people that may uh, fall into that um, realm of chronic homelessness. So a lot of ways um, w um, Gwen Jones talks about housing people who do have substance abuse issues, um, uh, otherwise known as wet housing. Example. Hypothetically speaking, if something like this was built where there was housing first, and uh, to what degree would that usurp our wet housing proposals that we talk about? Or are there still some people targeted by wet housing who are not necessarily homeless? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, well, you know, we really talk about permanent supportive housing, which is kind of the global term that captures people who require affordable housing, typically with an ongoing subsidy, but as Vanessa pointed out, provides that comprehensive array of services to support people and keep them housed. Those are typically people with significant addiction issues and chronic homelessness. Um, I'm not 
a huge proponent of the term <laughs> wet housing. We don't use that often, um, but that is tar so permanent supportive housing is targeting the most difficult to serve individuals who have typically been on the street for a very long time. And so that is kind of that core population of folks that are being unserved now. Okay, so um, the the problem with wet housing is, if you really think about it, it kind of encourages uh, use of of alcohol and substance stuff as well. So they're trying to figure out ways to. Uh, the city council has some thoughts tackling some of the more chronic homeless folks who have been arrested for disruption of the peace. Uh, but as of late, being drunk isn't illegal, and the people shouldn't be punished. And while the the Pav uh, uh, the Pavarel Center itself is a dry facility, which doesn't uh, admit people who to pe appear to be drunk or high, um, some of the Housing First programs will address this. So that's the program. That's what's called. It's called Housing First, and then working out through programs through those programs to help these folks along the way. Uh, the Pavarel Center has done a really good, well ho housing big populations but they want to move it to another uh, scenario to try to fix this. Uh, Jesse Ramos uh, believes that if you build, uh, he, he, uh, he made a comment, is this that if you build them, they will come. So for housing for the chronic homeless people, let's say if there you house 25 people, 25 more people will fill those gaps in the homeless population. And Vanessa Fry responds to this um, speculation. And people are just, the country's becoming more urbanized. Like, right? Look at, look at the census. So, like, we're becoming a very urbanized population, and so people are moving to city centers. And so I think we're going to continue to see an influx of more people needing services. Um, but I think it's how we're, we're um, addressing those services. It's, I don't think it'll be um, – and I don't think that these, these don't assume a stagnant level. It's just we're just looking at 25 people, right? So it could be that we have, you know, a fluctuation on our – homelessness population that you know over the course of a, a year or a couple of years um, this is just looking at specific people and addressing their needs then we have to think about how we address the needs of those you know outside this targeted population um, but I think there is a misconception that people you know oh if you provide something um, they will come and so the evidence base isn't out there that they're gonna um, come and fill in the blanks that those 25 people were in before if that makes sense. All right. So um, that was uh, Vanessa Fry once again. Um, I have one last quote from this meeting. Um, the costs associated with helping those who are homeless are not the same for projected homelessness to come to Missoula if they even come in the first place. Brian Von Loschbach talks details of Missoula resources for homelessness. And he and it's a nice little um, quote that I picked for uh, to wrap up this meeting. You know, there are other communities around the state that don't have the financial resources or the capacity to uh, deal with some of these issues. Um, Missoula does, even if, even though it does strain us. And this is an example where uh, the character of the community is such that we do lead out on this issue. And so I, I sometimes find myself tired of hearing about the stories of the bus tickets handed to individuals. Um, so be it. Um, some people in those other communities, I'm sure, are doing that um, because they don't have the, the capacity and the resources within their community to, um, to improve that situation, both for the residents as well as for the affected in, individual. Um, so, you know, <laughs> we can do that here. And um, I'm not going to lose any sleep at night over the idea that uh, – there are some bus tickets handed out uh, for people to come here. Um, in many ways, it's actually um, a sign of, I think as Gwen was referring to, the, com the compassion and character of the community. And we can do this in a way, and we can be smarter about the way that we do it, such that um, we're incredibly fiscally uh, responsible in the way that we deliver care and act on our values. So. Um, with that, Julie. All right. So um, if you really check out the numbers and the overall population of the city of Missoula, um, 344 homeless folks, 42 chronic homeless folks in the city of Missoula. I'm sure you've probably seen them in around the city of Missoula as well. If you've been around the downtown area, you probably see a couple of regular familiar faces that are on the street. Um, but um, w one of the things is... Um, God... It's just, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just a very interesting thing just to kind of think about um, 
where the city of Missoula is going and what what a lot of the resources that are in in place to help people um, basically who are going through a rough patch in their life. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this I mean, this presentation was a lot of it based on math and how much money um, the city of Missoula can actually save. And a lot of the, the we're in the sixth year of our ten year commitment to endless end homeless homelessness in the city of Missoula. Um, and just because you're homeless doesn't mean you don't have a roof over your head. Um, a lot of these folks are uh, staying with friends, staying with family, uh, basically uh, in and out of the pov now and again. And then of course you have then you have the chronic homeless people that are being addressed through these as well. And you can watch this whole meeting at the uh, committee of the whole meeting. Um, all you got to do is go on to ci.missoula.mt.us, and this is a great resource for anybody who uh, really wants to learn about uh, homelessness and how uh, some of the solutions that they did in Boise and uh, some things that'll work and some things that won't work. But in a lot of ways, if you, uh, the biggest thing I want you guys to take away with it is that it's cheaper to house a homeless person than it would be to um, pay for the medical costs. So with that, I'm going to end that. And we have a couple new programs going to be airing on MCAT. And, and when I come back, I'm going to tell you guys what you, uh, what's going on in the downtown art scene for First Friday. So stay with me. As indigenous people historically being impacted by governmental laws and acts such as forced land relocations, um, uh, boarding schools, um, the, the acts, the things that occurred historically were just many, too many to mention right now. But those acts placed us in a position where we were overall hurt consistently, consistently, generationally impacted, um, generationally oppressed. Today we call this generational hurt, you know, that intergenerational trauma. Uh, our indigenous history is not just history, that history has rippled through um, my blood and my people's blood and we're now dealing with the aftermath and much more. So personally speaking, um, uh, I can definitely say um, within my family, uh, I have a, a murdered family member in Canada. So that is, you know, where I'm from, and uh, we have in Canada uh, a database that actually acknowledges missing and murdered Indigenous women. And right now, that 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 count, the last time I looked, was about 1,181 missing and murdered Indigenous women, and this database just started. The costs of wildfire are pretty big. The question then is, well, what do we do? Right? I don't know what to do because I'm an economist, not a forester, but I can tell you the basic structure that we need to look at, right? So if you think about fire and how bad is it, well, you got four components. You got the spark, right? So most of the time, that's lightning. We don't got a whole, that's going to happen, whether we want it to or not. But there are some human-caused fires, so don't be stupid. Uh, so that's the way to deal with that. 
Second, on the fuel side, right? So uh, you have spark. Well, you need to have something for it to burn. Um, that's where a lot of the stuff that we're going to, I think, people talk about is how much fuel is left in the forest due to suppression activity, due to, due, due to changes in harvesting practices. Um, so there's you know, ultimately a, a large discussion about, well, what kind of fuel should we leave in the forest? And of course, then there's the climate, right? So you know, sparks and fuel are always in the forest, and yet we don't end up with the big forest fires every year. So what, what also changes? Well, when it's 90 degrees every day and doesn't rain for two months, climate matters and you end up with a big fire season. So obviously we have to think about what's happening with the climate. And then the last, of course, is suppression. We, we went to a workshop early in the book festival and, and um, gosh, what, what did the gal call it? It was kind of like her secret team or secret society. She had a special name for it. I just not, I'm not using the right one, but you know, you really need that group of people that believe in you and your writing and, and that will then send it out to their friends who send it out to their friends. So it's really a, a matter of building that team uh, that will, um, you know, because, you know, like it or dislike it, we we live and breathe on reviews. You know, that's, that's one of the things, the clear messages is that you've got to get reviews. Hey guys, welcome back. And now it's time to talk about your art guide throughout the city of Missoula. We're kicking things off with the Radius Gallery. Radius Gallery is a gallery in the downtown Missoula area among all these other galleries that will be in the downtown Missoula area. Um, before I get too cheeky, uh, starting at 4 p.m. presenting new works by three exceptional Montana artists in Radius Gallery's first exhibit of 2018. Hamilton-based artist Pamela Cogney returns to Radius with a new body of highly expressive ab abstract work in cold wax and in uh, in caustic. Beth Lowe, a Missoula-based ceramicist, um, ex uh, extends her uh, supremely endearing Good Children series of sculptures and functional works. Sean O'Connell um, specializes in kitchenware and combines contemporary decorative uh, motifs and utilitarian forms. Ooh, uh, okay. So uh, that's going to be happening at the Radius Gallery, and it's going to kick off the uh, first Friday events here in Missoula. Uh, happening at Bernice's Bakery is Elements by Katie McChain. Um, uh, the first Friday opening and art Missoula-based artist Katie McCain, sh she shows her current body of woodcut prints, a series of colorful landscape that explore the human relationship with the elements of nature. Um, Lake Missoula... F um, Lake Missoula Tea Company is hosting a mixed media gypsy jazz and free tea at Lake Missoula from 5 to 8 p.m. A, a combination of straight digital photography and darkroom manipulated images meet wood and wire in an interesting mixed media exhibition. So check it out. It's a lot of mixed media. It's pretty cool. Um, the next thing we have is um, cross sections. Missoula artist Amanda Crot six, um, cross six, um, current body of work. I'm sorry if I butchered that name, but it's a body of work transforming reclaimed wood from old scrap piles, remodeled houses, and remnants of projects into mountain landscapes. Each piece is an original interpretation, like a cross section of specific mountains or ranges among Montana and the West. Um, this is at the Four Ravens Gallery, and you can check it out. Um, this next one we got here is student art show from the kids at Learn Inc. Learn Inc. is a nonprofit. K through 12 school for um, people for uh, whole person learning. Um, they will be hosting its inaugural student art show first Friday at Learn Inc. And you can check out all this stuff by going on to the website learninc.org. Um, Homestead Fever is going to be at Gallery 709 inside Monta Montana Art and Framing. Traveling Central Montana for the last four years, Lee um, Silman returns to Gallery 709 with an 8 by 10 black and white contact prints of the remnants of the homesteads from nearly early 20th century using his famous 8x10 view camera. This exhibit opens Friday and it go and it runs through February 24th. So you have pretty much all month to check it out. It's at 709 Ronan Street, hence Gallery 709. Up next, we got uh, David Miles Lusk. And he's doing noteworthy paper and press. Um, it's a local block printer who is inspired by the inter intersections of science and mythology um, and nature and humanity. So you can check that out. It's going to be at the Zootown Arts Community Center. Um, and he also, oh, actually, well, no, it's going to be at, uh, wait, wait, it's going to be at Noteworthy and Press. Sorry about that. But he's also going to be teaching a class at Zootown Arts Community Center about local block printing. 
So um, another First Friday event is going to be at Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Montana Properties. They usually like to open um, things here. And Laura uh, um, Verhaeg um, is Missoula, Montana's base photographer specializing in wildlife, landscape, and canines. canines. Oof. Her, photo <laughs> her photographic style reflects her love of exploration mas matched with her passion for the outdoors. And she can also be found chasing the fading light of day with her camera in hand and her faithful plot hound, Darwin, by her side. So this is going to be an interesting art installation at Berkshire Hathaway. They always get interesting, eccentric people to do their shows, so it should be fun. Uh, happening first Friday is Contemporary West. I'm um, going to be at the... Uh, the um, Let's see here. And it's going to be feature three artists here. It's Nicole Jean Hill, Meredith Lynn, and Lee Emma running. Um, join for their cross country for a collaborative show about the contemporary West. And this is going to be at, at the Frontier Space Gallery. Uh, we got YMCA. Um, they're uh, going to be doing a Missoula Family YMCA at La Stella Blue. And it's uh, basically all art made from kids aged three to five years old. And so go to La Stella Blue for your first Friday needs. Um, happening at the place, the artist shop, um, um, harnessing the power and magic. So the artist shop is hosting a pottery is rich with tradition. This is a major reason why artists choose to do clay as their medium express their visions and forms in form of narrative. When World War II ended in 1945, America and Japan decided to go to work together to build peace and entailed closeness and sharing. One of the remarkable gifts that America received was a connection to the 2000 year tradition of Asia, Asian ceramic art and craft. Japan used different style ki um, kilns and had very different approaches to beauty, so along with a firing efficiency. America ceramics learned to experiment with new ways of looking and new ways of making. And that's going to be at the artist shop. And um, before I get a little too ahead of myself, uh, International Cups is going to be at the Clay Studio. Um, International Cups 2018 at the, uh, the, the Clay Studio of Missoula is an exhibit uh, showcasing ceramic work that explores the infinite possibilities of ideas of just a simple mug or cup. Juried by Sue Turrell, uh, a nationally recognized potter from Montana. Ooh. Works by 40 artists have been selected from over 135 entries from all over the world. Accepted works are from the United States, Canada, and the Netherlands. So, International Cup 2018 reception happening at the Clay Studio of Missoula. Um, you can check it out. It's going to be great. Um, and that basically takes care of all your rundown of everything you guys need to know about what's happening for your first Friday events. I got an art clip for you guys. It's going to be amazing and it is of all the art that you guys are going to be missing out after you guys miss the art auction that will be hosted on Saturday. So, Missoula Art Museum, um, here's a little taste of, of the art auction, Power. So thanks to our very own Rick Phillips for producing those uh, short um, art clip highlights. Um, it's nice to get a nice representation of some of the art that comes through the city of Missoula because you never know if you ever see some of the artworks that you have just seen for you in the future. But you guys won't see that particular art video after today. So, 
Oh, well, it'll basically all be over. It's all over now um, by the time um, you guys might be able to check it out one more time tonight. But it'll be uh, art auctioned off happening Saturday from 5 to 8 p.m. with your s events. Um, I got a lot of events happening, and we're going to kick through some events off with uh, some of your, of your early Friday events. Uh, the Wilma is hosting a, a series of Backcountry Film Festival starting now it's it started at 7 a.m. So uh, uh, unless they got the a.m. p.m. switch, I'm pretty sure they did. Usually uh, people are really bad about it, but you can go to the Top Hat online via log jampresents.com for tickets and more. Um, Missoula Indoor Sports Arena, Mismo and Roots Acro Sports Center is doing some gymnastics stuff for all ages from 9 to 12 p.m. Storytime and Tiny Tales is doing some story time, so uh, work out your brains, um, and if you have kids that are learning to read or you want your kid to learn to read, Missoula Public Library is the place to be at 10.30 a.m. for s Tiny Tales. Storytime is for a little older kids from like 3 to 5, and then of course Tiny Tales is from walking to three years of age. Groundhog Day is all day, so today is actually Groundhog Day, and um, why not celebrate Groundhog Day by watching a marathon of Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. Um, join Bill Murray and Andy McDowell and a whole bunch of Chris Elliott, a whole bunch of other people as well. I think um, Elizabeth Shue is in this movie as well, but uh, enjoy a whole bunch of people in this wonderful, um, heartwarming comedy, romance, genre blending movie that came out in the early 90s. Um, and it'll be playing at the uh, Roxy Theater all day. You can get a simple screen for $8, or you can do the whole entire marathon for $10, and you can um, do unlimited popcorn, fountain drinks, and coffee for $25. So you can basically start that at 11 t uh, a.m. this morning. Um, watercolor and yarn starting at 12 p.m. at the Missoula Public Library. If you guys are going, if you guys want to um, pick up some arts and crafts, um, watercolor and yarns is going to be at the Missoula Public Library starting at uh, um, 12 p.m. And around 12 p.m. as well is uh, Bridge and Cribbage. So if you're interested in doing some lunch and you're hanging out with some uh, old people at the Missoula Senior Center, the Golden Oldies, you get to um, play them at Bridge and Cribbage and beat them and make them feel horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, that was I probably okay. Never mind. Moving on. Um, teen Writers Group, um, Missoula Public Library hosts a Teen Writers Group every Friday from 3:30 to 5:30 p.m. Have some chocolate, improve some teenagers' writing skills, and this is for anybody who is considered a teenager, so 13 to 19. Get it? All right, moving on. Um, Forrester's Ball is happening tonight and tomorrow night at the University of Montana. The Forrester Ball is a student-run fundraising event in which forestry students turn Shriver's um, Gym into a 1890s lodging town and raise money for scholarships. Um, Steve Fram and his Western Rebels w will be the musical entertainment. There will be a Beer Garden Serving Bonner Lager by Kettle House Brewing Company. Doors close at 10 p.m. And you can come join them for a swinging good time. Live tonight on MCAT's live streaming is a unique concert event called Fusion Number no. 9. University of Montana is hosting this um, experience and seamless array of every type of music imaginable in one compact, powerful concert hosted by Dr. B Robert Ledbetter, big band choir, steel drums, pan uh, piano, wind ensemble, cabaret, string, student, percussion, facility, chamber, soloist, more <laughs> pattern after Eastman's Prism concert. Each musical act is limited in length and transitions without silence into the next. It has quickly become one of the most popular UM School of Music concerts of the year. Of um, Let's see. Yeah, that's uh, basically everything you need to know what's happening for your Friday. Um, of course, um, first Friday, it's happening. I already kind of gave you the rundown of all the events that are happening as well. I'm going to kind of go over some of your Saturday events after I um, yeah, you have a couple nightly events. I'll just kind of breeze over them. You have Party Goers EP release party. Never heard of them. Electronic music at the Roxy. Um, you got Bradley Warren Jr. at the VFW Folk Music. You got Lolo Creek Band at Sunrise Saloon. You got Mudslide Charlie at the Union Club. And you got uh, Rot Gut Wines to Killer Mockingbirds. Perfect Blue at VFW. Um... <laughs> And yeah, that's pretty much it for your Friday night late night events if you guys are going out and about. Um, there's the art auction. I just want to talk about this a little bit more just before we wrap up. From 5 to 9 p.m., the University uh, Center Ballroom at the University of Montana. You can call them at 728-0447 to reserve a table or 
of 10 or get tickets to the sell out of the, of course this event always sells out so celebrate the power of the 46th benefit art auction at the MAM we they believe that it has enormous power and in ignites innovation um, engage in next generation transforms perspectives and inspire a life time love of collecting contemporary art experience this energy and generosity of 80 local and nationally renowned artists who donate new and vibrant works this year including john buck beth Lowe, stephen young lee and wendy red star this benefit art auction provides critical for sport for the missoula art museum's contemporary art exhibition and education programs your bid at this auction supports the transformative work of artists and contemporary arts in our community and of course let's go back to some of the things that are happening saturday morning um you can get your tax um returns prepared for free at the university of montana starting at 9 a.m you got some zoo town kickers starting at 10 a.m for kids two to seven years of age from 10 to 1 p.m. And this is in Missoula Indoor Sports Arena. Register at MissoulaIndoor.com or you can just drop in. Long Pose Classical Figure Drawing Class, Fine Arts, Missoula Fine Arts Studio is doing some naked drawings. So you have to be 18 and older to draw a life portrait of the model as well. And I don't know if you have to pay because you have to pay the model. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, but, 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 of course, um, MCAT stuff. Um, MCAT is doing Saturday drop-ins from 1 to 5. They do it every single Saturday. It's for kids age 9 to 14 years of age. We do stop animation. We do some live action filming. Um, you get to hang out with me and my, uh, and my coworker here, Neil, where we'll be making um, videos and showing kids how to make videos. It's a very um, openly creative, free environment. So the whole idea is like it's, it's a drop-in. You drop your kids off for four hours for ten dollars, like that's like two 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 dollars and fifty cents an hour for like babysitting, and the kids get to basically make something or hopefully not break something. So, <laughs> and that's what's happening there. Um, but also, huh, there's so much stuff happening here. As of yesterday, MCAT launched Spring Flicks. So, um, if you guys are planning on doing anything in the future, as in spring break, which is March 26th through the 30th, and I will be talking about this all February and most of March, um, more uh, March than in February, but this is a um, basically camp. And during spring break, the kids get a week off, but you don't have to let them have a week off f for from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, March 26th to the 30th. For only $150, yes, $150 for the whole entire week, you can drop your kids off here and we can basically do an extended thing of what we do for a Saturday drop-in. So if you're not sure what MCAT's all about, you can have your kids come to our Saturday drop-in and then you can ask them, hey, would you want to be there for um, from 9 to 3 p.m.? Of course, then some of you would be like, you're going here. I don't care. Just, just leave me alone. So that's that's just an interesting thing. So just uh, yeah, just think about it. It'll be on our web page. You can click on many of our links. Go to MCAT. You can click anywhere on this page, and it will bring you to that wonderful link. You go to How Do I Spring Flicks Camp, and it it's never too early to think about spring, and it's never too early to think about Wake Up Missoula because Wake Up Missoula has our own web page, wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. So nice we made you write it out twice. It is a wonderful web page full of content and videos and fun little gags for you guys to enjoy, including some interviews from the community, some dubbing stuff, you got some behind the scenes, and I suggest you check out our vlog from behind the scenes of our sports. MCAT will be live streaming um, the Fusion concert tonight, number nine, at MCAT.org, local live, and also we'll be live streaming the basketball game between Sentinel and Glacier uh, from Flathead. So stay with us um, tomorrow at on Facebook. You will see us streaming at uh, 4.15 p.m. So like MCAT to uh, get notifications of us live stream. So for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp, and I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And that's about it for me. Thank mm -hmm. you.